G'day everyone. For those who came in late, you're listening to X Band. Five hundred years ago, he washed ashore the sole survivor of a shipwreck, and upon the skull of the man who killed his dad, he said, "I'm mad. I must eradicate piracy, injustice, and cruelty, and all my sons will follow me." So evil doers will believe that this man cannot die. The man the ghost who walks. The man Enemies beware. The phantom's always there, but you won't find the phantom. Hello, we are the Chronicle Chamber team and we're delighted to be joining you once again for a uh, Expand the Phantom podcast podcast. Our website is chroniclechamber.com and you can contact us via email, chroniclechamber, chroniclechamber at gmail.com or you can subscribe to us via YouTube, iTunes or any of the Android apps. You might be listening to us or you might be watching us on YouTube and uh, welcome to you. Whatever your preferred medium, my name is Dan Fraser and tonight I'm joined by Jermaine Parker. How are you, Jermaine? Not bad, mate. You saved that quite well. That's what happens when you go off the when you uh, go away from the run sheet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I try not to read it word for word every time because uh, again, my, must, must get a little bit repetitive. Um, but uh, people who who want to skip the intro can just spend plus the uh, plus thirty seconds and skip ahead to wherever <laughs> they want to tune in. <laughs> How's life in WA at the moment? Uh, it's cold over here. We've actually um, now. I know everyone else, you know, over in say like. Tasmania, Victoria, and then uh, you know our friends in Norway and Sweden and stuff are going to laugh when I say this, but um, you know we, we've had a couple of mornings where it's reached like you know under five degrees. It's um, <laughs> <laughs> I saw I saw the forecast or the or the report that said it was four degrees in Perth, and I thought I won't even bother to message Jermaine today because he won't get out from under the doona. It'll be that cold. <laughs> we're just we're just not used to this cold weather. <laughs> Uh, it, it is chilly over here as well, hence the uh, hence the undershirt under the heavy fan inning shirt, um, and too cold in Ballarat for Steve to join us. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, it was. I, I think he, I think he kind of looked out the door, saw the mist going the way to the car, and he just thought, "Mate, by the time I get there, I'll you know, nah. <laughs> and then went back inside. <laughs> too, too cold to be in the garage recording a podcast from the car. <laughs> yes. Yes. Actually, I think I think he's actually packing the car to go on holidays, hence because uh, uh, he's he's taking off in the morning. So thanks any, um, for sending your messages through, Stephen. We'll try and uh, try and do you justice as we go through tonight. Uh, now tonight um, we will get into it because I have a feeling this could be a really long one if we let ourselves uh, get carried away. Um, it's episode one ninety two um, because of. Well, because of 2021, there's been a lot of a lot of stuff going on for us uh, with a lot of interviews that we wanted to bring you as soon as we possibly could. The uh, in timely fashions, the KFS podcast with T uh, was always going to be one that we wanted to get out as quickly as possible. So anyway, for one reason or another, um, we've pushed back the comics and news until it's probably two two and a half months worth of stuff, which is more than we usually like. Um, and so, in all likelihood, 192 is going to be a part A and a part B. I'd say. Um, so, uh, you're happy with that, Germ? Yeah, no, uh, in traditional, uh, free numbering, um, uh, you know, it's going to, yeah, it's going to be there. And because of that, we probably should actually make mention of it up the front. Um, we have quietly gone over 200 podcasts and, um, it kind of snuck up to us and it wasn't until we were actually, um, thinking about, oh, what are we going to do for episode 200? And yep. then we were uploading, I think we were uploading the um, uh, 190 episode and then we got a reminder saying, oh, congratulations, this is your 200th episode. And we're like, oh, wow. So Yeah, yeah. I'm just looking back to see which episode it was. I think it was 190, wasn't it? The Phantom of the yeah. Future podcast yeah. was actually our 200th. So, um, so here we are. This is what our 202nd actual podcast. So, And we're planning A's and B's. So anyway, <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> All right. Um, so we're going to focus on, uh, if, if this is 192A, we're going to focus on the comics in this particular podcast. We're going to have a look at everything that's come out from through and around the rest of the world um, since last time we got together and reported a comics and news. So we're going to start with, and I'm sure Germ will, will, will put a lot of these images up on the screen for the YouTube listeners as well, but I'm holding up um, through episode 1892, Diana and the Heartbreak Gang. Um, we've actually had uh, reference to this story in a number of podcasts already, including the um, the dedicated podcast we had with the creative team, Matt Kime and Shane Foley, and also spoken about it extensively in, in the, the KFS 
podcast that I mentioned with Tufugna as well. So um, uh, but we actually haven't sat down and reviewed the story or the comic. So we won't spend long on this because we've uh, uh, it given it a fair run over the last few podcasts. But um, from a review perspective, Germ, if we're going to talk about the, the story and the comic in, in traditional style, what did you think of the cover? Um, the cover, the cover I like, um, you know, it, it's, I, I love the, the, like the old feel, the, you know, like the paper, the paper, um, the paper cover, um, you know, and then you've got the, you know, the classic, you know, for those who have come in late with the, um, with the image down the bottom and stuff like that. It's got the feel that I, for me, the best set of through stories and through issues and have got the most excitement are in the 900s. And this feels like it comes from that era. It does. So, you know, um, I love how Fru have done this and I love how Matt Kime and Shane Foley have come together and, and, and brought us the story and stuff like that. Um, you know, I, I, I will, I will admit I prefer the Tessa cover uh, to this one, um, which was the day at the races cover. Um, mm. Again, that will be on the screen for the YouTube viewers, but you know, this is a great, you know, it's a great cover. I like how it's highlighting Diana and mm. not just the Phantom. So for the buffs out there, um, you know, how many uh phantom phantom covers are out there with um without the phantom on it and um because Diana technically isn't the phantom. So um, you know, for the yeah. for the buffs out there, it'll be interested to see if anyone can um come up with a number. But um yeah, it, it's it's a great issue, it's a great cover. Um I had fun. I had fun doing the podcast. Um everyone that I've talked to has enjoyed it as well. So um yeah. Yeah. Look, uh, and it, on, on the same read of the cover, like the simplistic, um, it, it does, takes you back to that 900s era, which with our ages was when we fell in love with the, the character. There's a lot of nostalgia to be had with um, the simple tones. The, the, um, there's a lot of space on the front cover. It's the classic blue, the yellow strip. Um, and pick that up in conjunction with the paper feel exactly as you said. So the story itself, we've, we've gone over and talked with the creators about it. We haven't probably said explicitly what our... Um, thoughts of the story were and, and how much we liked it or, or, or otherwise. Um, so we had that nostalgic feel as we pick up the comic and, and start to get into it. Um, did you have the same feeling as we as we read the story? What did you think of the quality of the story, etc.? I will admit, I probably enjoyed this. I probably enjoyed this story more than the day at the races. Mm. Um, now, I and I don't think it was just because Shane Foley did the art and. Um, you know, has added to the art in a sense. And I'm not sure if that's the right terminology, but that's mm. how I kind of see it. But because what I like about this story is all the, and what I like more about this story than I did um, the other one is one, just a little, like the little nods, like say, for instance, you know, you've got this panel here where you've got, um, you know, the phantom hitting the guy, you know, that's a, mm a fairly well-known panel. Uh, you've got Diana playing a good role in it as well. Um, you've got the the female gangs. You know, they're the kind of elements that I enjoyed, which has probably made me enjoy this story more than the day, the day at the races as well. And I think also, I think I get it a little bit more second time around rather than just the first time around. Because I think the first time around, even though I understood the concept, I think I get it more now the second time around than I did the first time. And I, I reckon a few other fans might have found, might, might have got it a little bit better as well. Cause I've talked to a couple of fans or, uh, you know, one fan in particular, he didn't, he doesn't have that, um, that nostalgic, uh, tug and he didn't quite understand it. He didn't quite understand why people loved it so much. And then once he was explained to him and then he got some of those issues and he had a look at it, he was like, ah, I understand it now. And then he's in, he himself has enjoyed it more as well. So I reckon there might be, you know, for all us grey-head people, all the bald-head well, people, no, yeah. um, <laughs> for all those old-timers, I think we will get it and we enjoyed it. But I think some of the newers, the newbies, might not have enjoyed it as much the first time and might enjoy it more the second time around. 
makes it interesting to project 30, 40 years from now into the future and see what people will find nostalgic, you know, um, when they're doing their, their um, what's the word, uh, hologram podcast and, we're, and they're standing up in your living room talking to you about their fan comics. I wonder what they're going to be nostalgic about for, for the two. You know what they'll be nostalgic about? And uh, cue the picture, um, sand, the Sandal Singh storyline. <laughs> uh, I, I, you could not wipe the smile off my face for days after listening to to T and what she had to say about that storyline. Uh, anyway, go back and listen to episode one ninety one if you have a, a dozen times. It's just worth hearing that many that many yeah. times. Um, look, I really enjoyed the story as well, Diana and the Heartbreakers gang. Um, I didn't sort of really peg it against the day at the races. I, I can understand the thinking, oh, which Matt Kime story did I enjoy the most? Um, look, I, I enjoyed this one. Yeah, probably a bit more, I suppose. I, I don't know. Um, I really, yeah, but there was a not just a nostalgic, maybe it's all it all adds into it, but just the way that they tapped into, and, and Matt and both and Shane both tapped into that um, that feel of a 1940s story um, really, really worked for me. So, um, no, I really recommend this one and I'll, um, I've bought a few extra copies to give away and send as bonuses to, to people that I know that, uh, that I think will enjoy it as well. So, mm. anyway, um, anyway we've, we've done 1892, Diner and the Heartbreakers getting to death really over the last uh, few episodes. So we'll move on um, to Triumph of Evil. Now, this is uh, issue 1893. It's got the cover by Luca Alberta. Um, wraparound cover, as you can as you can see there, and Jim will um, put up periodically on the YouTube as well. But um, I really love this wraparound cover. The, the, the single cover doesn't do it. Where are we? The single cover really doesn't do it justice. When you open it up and see the full double cover spread, my goodness, if that's not a poster, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Um, Luca's... Luke is on fire at the moment with his um, uh, with his cover art. He's been doing some great covers for free um, with this one, uh, like the Christmas special and, and, and some others. But then he's also been doing some really good ones for um, Phantom Men as well. So I would go as far as saying that um, Luca has done better covers for 2021 than uh, mainstay uh, Henrik Solstrom. Um, and... Um, I know, you know, and I'm a big fan of Selstrom, um, mm. but um, yeah, uh, I think Luca is, is really on fire at the moment. Um, I really, I really like the the soft colours, you know, and it was an interesting choice doing this cover, which is a soft cover for the story, for the Don Newton story, which is a lot of blacks, a lot mm. of um, a lot of uh, harsh colors, I guess you could say, you yeah. know, it's, it's, it's a huge contrast having, um, you know, a soft cut, a soft, you know, the soft pastels with the harsh yeah. blacks. No, I completely get what you're saying. It's a vastly different contrast in styles. Um, and, and an interesting choice. I like it to be honest, because, um, uh, it, 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 because of the contrast, that yin and the yang, I think it, it works really well. It's really effective. So uh, have, now, you, have you, you read this story before? I was about to ask you the same question. No, prior to picking up this issue, no, I had not read this. Have you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I've, I've read it. I've got it in, um, I've got it in the Charlton um, mm -hmm. as well. So, um, and then I think I've got it in one or two other different countries and stuff like that as well. Um, okay, so... Presentation-wise, how does this stack up against um, you know, the original? Like the the original Charlton is in 1975, so obviously we're talking very different um, printing eras. Um, I don't know where your other versions are from, but in terms of the quality of the presentation, um, some of the some of them are okay, and then some of them don't. Some of the pages on here don't look the absolute best. Um, and, it, and it's hard because it would have been in colour originally. Um, but I think overall, like, this page is probably not the best because there's some um, colour shading and when you've turned it into black and white, it hasn't. Mm -hmm. So and that page is page, eight, page eight, yeah, on the under the submarine. It hasn't come across as good. But a lot of the other pages, especially what I really love is the... Um, you know, some of these pages, like page 2021, where you've got the the phantom, um, uh, what do you call it, 
becomes the, you know, when the 21st becomes the Phantom and some of the pages and um, uh, this is another page, another panel that might have come across too black, the bottom mm. of page 26. Oh, that that closing image for the story, I really like that. It'd be interesting to see it in colour, but I, I quite liked it as a black and white. Mm. Well, if you're looking at it on YouTube, you will see um, it in colour. Uh, so there will be a colour version of it as well. Um, I, look, it's for for a lot of fans, they probably haven't seen a lot of um, uh, Don Newton. Now, for for some fans, Don Newton is like top five Phantom artist. Yeah, he's and got, certainly his original art is a holy grail for a lot oh, of people. Yeah, like you know, and his artwork is holy grail for not just Phantom collectors, but for other collectors as well. Like there's, um, you know, and uh, you know, and in in talking to a lot of Don Newton fans, they say his Phantom work is like the pinnacle of his career. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, it, yeah. If you ever manage to get a hold of uh, a Don Newton uh, page, do it. Don't let it go. Unless you're selling it to me, then let it go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah, it, you know, to be honest, I would rather a Don Newton original than a Ray Moore original. That's how high I really. That's how high I rate him, and how high I would want a Don Newton original. Yeah, I I, I couldn't go with you on that one. Like, yeah. if someone came and offered me um, three pages of this book versus one Ray Moore, and you know, I'm not allowed to pass it on or sell it or anything like that. I'm taking the Ray Moore every day of the week. Yeah, yeah, and most and a lot of people will, but mm. um. You know, I know I'm not the only fan who would say yeah. that and who would do that. Um, yeah. So, look, the story is a little bit different because it tells a different version of how the 20th Phantom dies. I was going to ask you about that, yeah. Um, now, that's unfortunate. Look, all right. For me, it's not a huge issue, um, but... I think for a lot of, for, for some fans, it will be an issue. Unfortunately, um, Charlton, when they were creating their own stories, they didn't have someone like, uh, they didn't have a KFS editor like T, who mm. was, who would try and put things in alignment. And KF and Charlton kind of went on their own tangent, and the Phantom kind of became like a, a, um, a Tarzan in a purple leotard in a mm. lot of the way it kind of happened. Um, and unfortunately, I think that is one of the reasons why the Phantom is probably not as popular as he is. Because when a lot of the people, when they were reading the Charlton, they they have the, they were reading it with the same mindset as the Tarzan, oh, a white lord in the jungle. Where in the Charlton stories, in a lot of the Charlton stories, he is like that. But as we know because we've read through, we've read newspaper stories, we've read the Team Egmont stories. He's not like that at all. He hasn't been like that since probably the mm. first five newspaper stories. But the Charlton stories have kind of gone on a tangent and align themselves more to a Tarzan than what they have actually with the Phantom. So yeah, okay. that's certainly my the, problem with the Charlton stories. Yeah. And certainly the, the, t the, the two things that I jotted down um, straight away after reading this story were, hang on, this is, tells a different tale of how the 20th Phantom was killed. Um, also, um, Garan at, at, and the and the Banda don't know that he's immortal, um, and that comes out. And so that, again, so those two things are both counter to what we know immediately yeah. Yeah. Um, about the Phantom universe, particularly the second one. But um, the belt... By, it was the Sunday story where we first heard about the 20th Phantom's death. That was 1954, so that's 21 years before this story was published. So I wonder if there were um, Phantom fans in America who read this Charlton story when it came out in 1975 and have gone, oh, you guys don't quite get it, um, and perhaps turned off Charlton a little bit that way as well. Yeah, it's, it's a pity because um, Charlton at the beginning, so you, you, for those who have come in late, dum -dum, yeah, you got the gold key, then you got the king, and the gold key and king were kind of um, Bill Lignate was involved in it, so he kind of knew what was going on and kind of knew knew about he was involved with the newspaper stories and stuff. So they were quite 
well aligned with it. But then when Charlton, which is a, was another company, came upon it, was um, Charlton was kind of like a, a a gateway into DC and Marvel in a sense. It was kind of like they they brought out cheap comics. They you know churned them out really 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 quickly. Like mm. you know, um, you know Bill you know Bill Harris who was a writer and stuff like that. He would write you know he would write a story a day and you know, churn them out. And then the stories were not meant to be masterpieces. It was literally, let's get these comics out. Let's do it by mass production and flood the market and we'll make our money by quantity instead of quality. Um, and so I think what has happened is when Charlton came on board, we didn't get good stories and we got the short stories, which we see in the giant size. But then Don Newton came on board and he produced great covers, great art. But unfortunately, it didn't last. No, and the stories, um, as we've said, you know, don't quite line up with what we understand to be proper yeah. Phantom canon. So while this is a strong story in its own right, if you're a, a Phantom aficionado, as we are, and, and probably listening to this, you know, it, you 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 just put it down, going, oh, well, that's not quite, that yeah. doesn't fit. You know, it's a good story, but it doesn't fit within the rest of the yeah. within the rest of the canon, which, um, you know. You know, you can still enjoy this story. The, the, oh. Actually, the, the strongest takeaway I had from this one in terms of the writing quality, um, Kit Jr. or, or, or 20, what, 21st Phantom, he's on his way back to help the Phantom. He, the, the 20th Phantom has been pondering, pondering his own mortality and all the rest of it. So um, the 21st, as he turns out, swings past the Skull Cave to pick up his kit um, pardon the pun, to pick up his costume and stuff to go to where his dad's in trouble. I wonder if he hadn't gone via that detour to the Skull Cave and taken the time to pick up the costume. He might have arrived in time to save his dad because uh, this yeah, is yeah. out by seconds if you follow the story. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, one thing I did like is that when Fru put in this advert, you know, that was strategic. So you could get this beautiful um, double page. So that was good, good for free for putting a, a, a mid comic advert. So we got that. One yep. thing I would have probably uh, a slight criticism to Dudley and to the editorial staff at Free is maybe in the message from the publisher they should have just put a little note saying, "Hey, this is a Charlton story. It tells about a, a different death to the twentieth than what most." readers are aware of welcome to the to the wonderful world of comics and he could have just left it at that it could have been a little bit of a nod like you know so that way the readers new readers who are slightly confused mm. read it and go oh okay yeah that's all good because i think when you when you understand it and and you're aware of it whether it's after or beginning and stuff like that you're not pondering about it it's just like ah, oh, yeah that's comics and you kind of move on and it doesn't become an issue but yeah. um, so I wonder if just yeah. a, a and Dudley, bit... Dudley certainly has had a line like that in a lot of his message from the yeah. publishers in the past. So um, he probably needs to have it just as a standard line that goes in the in the in the side here where he lists the author, the creator, um, the artist, and all that sort of thing. He probably just needs to have an asterisk in there. Hey, this doesn't fit with everything else, and he'll always be right, no matter no matter which story they publish. Yeah, <laughs> even if, even if he produces a Lee Fork story, it won't always Correct. be right as well. Um, <laughs> Jim Shepard was very big on that, but I think Jim Shepard went too far where he would say, this is a European story, disregard it, but it's a great story and it's, you know, it's got great art and, and it's just kind of like, he's, yeah, just, you know. just Well, because, that's part of how yeah. Jim managed to create me as a forecast, so I'm not going to criticise <laughs> him for it. <laughs> yeah, I just think that sometimes he went a little bit too far. Fair um, enough. <laughs> I, I, and I, I wonder, like, when you when you're doing something like that, you kind of have to, and this is where Stephen's good at it, you, can, you almost have to be on the fence because so you don't alienate both parties and it's like, you know, mm. some people may not like this because of this, but others will like it because of this. You decide. Oh, and look, I still enjoyed this as a story. I can, yeah. I'm oh. old enough and ugly enough to, you know, to be able to go, oh, okay, I get it. It's, uh, you know, they, they haven't quite got it. They didn't have that editorial oversight yeah. that King Features is supplying now. Um, so, you know, slight little tweaks. Um, yeah, I still enjoyed it as a story overall. And then it leads into um, the, the Phantom of the Future Forever um, story, which we, again, we've talked about in a podcast and, you know, part of the reason why this comics and news has been so delayed 
is to try and, and squeeze in a topical chat with Andrew Constant, the author. Um, but again, we didn't review the story as such. So I'm going to start on the artwork. Massimo Gimberi's art is something that really stood out to me in this story. Um, you talk about Luca Roberta as someone who's really hitting it out of the park at the moment. As far as a story artist goes, and question without notice, Jim, as far as a story artist goes, is there anyone doing better work than Massimo Gimberi at the moment? Um, from a yes and no. Um, <laughs> from a... <laughs> One thing I love about Massimo's work um, is the detail is just the, you know, there's just beauty in it. But one thing that I think where he has a slight weakness is that I feel some of the panels, there isn't that movement in the panels. Um, that's, you know, and, and look, I'm, not everyone's going to agree with me. Um, I, I, but I just feel like in, in some of the panels, it just feels like, you know, like, like sometimes when you read a, a Lee Fork, I mean, a, a Cy Barry um, story, and then you read some other stories and stuff like that, it's, it's, it's like reading a cartoon or an animation where, you know, where, yes, they're done static, but you can basically see them move as you're reading it and stuff like that. And in some of the panels, I don't get that with Massimo. It, it feels that, the, pardon the pun, sometimes the people feel a little bit robotic. Um, mm. in, in, and it's just, it's not every panel. There's some great movement in, mm. in stuff, but in just some of the panels, I just feel like, you know, they're a little bit stiff, a little bit robotic. But in saying all of that, you know, the, the amount of detail you've got and stuff like that, he's a, he's a beautiful artist. He knows what he's doing. Um, he can draw a a beautiful guy or a beautiful, you know, uh, person. And, and I think, and I think he's like got, um, and, and now I'm going to reference some of the other pictures that he posts on Facebook and that sort of thing as well. I think he's got human physique down really, really well. Uh, beautiful guy. You said there, he does. He, he, he draws a really, um, uh, well proportioned, not your, your, Walnuts phantom. He's a, this is a real man with with you know, um, and and likewise with the women. And that's the they're the, some of the images that he's show, he's got on Facebook as well. If you're not on uh, following Massimo Gambari on Facebook, I thoroughly recommend it because in terms of someone who posts up images of his art and a wide variety of art, certainly not just phantom. Um, Massimo's and Massimo's fantastic for it. So jump on Facebook and follow him if you can. Um, the the concept, and we touched on it in, in well, didn't touch on it. We dove deep on it in a previous podcast, but just to just to touch on it now, the concept of um, you know if if this isn't canon uh, because well, T. Fugner's approved it as KFS. I don't know, but um, I like how Andrew this is the idea it. of this is the last human phantom, and from here yeah. on in, you've only got the android. What are your thoughts on that one? Um, look, I've and. It took me a long time to actually come to a decision because mm. it, it, it sat on me. And I, I said this during the podcast mm. um, and I said it with Andrew and I think he kind multiple of, times in the chat. You've, you've yeah. Not, I think he yeah. was almost not, not pleased, but I think he was kind of slightly amused that it kind of stumped me um, <laughs> because I, the thing I like about the Phantom and I'm not a DC Marvel comic book reader i don't collect those i have the phantom and then i've got a, a little bit of other collections of comics and stuff like that but the thing that i love about the phantom is that he is his humanity and i think the reason why i am so unsure about this story is because yes and i know it's got the 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 humanity of the 21st phantom but in a sense a robotic phantom loses his humanity and the humanity is probably one of the top three th things that I love and that has me addicted to the Phantom and makes me do things like podcasts and, and spend lots of money and stuff like that. So <laughs> losing the humanity, it has really got me like, oh, I'm not sure about this. But, um, he's, but he's got the downloaded humanity of yeah. the 21st Phantom, which is the one we love the most. 
Yeah, yeah, and I know, and I know there's the whole ghost in the shell, and you know all these other different aspects and all that. But that's the reason why I I really don't know about it. Now, you said something a little bit before about it not being canon. I like what Andrew said is that anything that's not that's different is really only canon when the fans, which in a sense are the true owners of the Phantom, yeah, true. decide that it's canon. And, that, and like the belt, the, the chain on the Skull Throne is a really good example of that because yes. for a long time it's not canon, but for whatever reason, probably since the movie, um, fans have decided that the chain on the Skull yes. Throne is canon. And even though Lee Fork, as, as you've pointed out a number of times, only used it once and then um, never we never saw it again in a Lee Fork story, so we've it's, still, it's never, canon, we've still never seen that chain in a newspaper story, even now, even in modern day with Tony oh, right? Paul and Mike Manley and stuff like that. It's never, the chain has never, so there's and been And yet that'd one, be the first yeah. thing people look for when they see a, a, a picture of the skull throne, oh, does it have the chain on it? Yeah, yeah. And it, and it happens. There's, you know, f- people would do pictures of the phantom sitting on the throne and the first thing that they'll say is there's no chain there's no mm. chain there's no mm. chain and it's like well so, yeah so if there's a critical mass of fans who will go actually you know what at a time undetermined into the future um the phantom there's a nuclear holocaust or whatever happens in in forever so what would that take do you want to see do you want to see these eight page stories with android phantom in the future and we see what that actually looks like so that perhaps it can sink in and, and we get to choose whether we like it or not because because this yeah. one story is not going to do it we need to actually see probably i, I want to say five or six stories with this android phantom in the future to see to give us a feel for what that could look like and feel like yeah part of me is like let's leave it and just <laughs> And let's just, <laughs> in typical Phantom aspect, let's just leave it dangling Interesting idea. as a, let's, as let's a, ma- as a maybe. <laughs> but then a part of me is like you as well. It's like, okay, let's explore it. And it only needs to be four or five eight-page stories. Mm. And if, if the story is good, if the artwork is good, fans will like it and it will become canon. Now, this one... I think it's got a lot of fans on the fence. If we never see it, I think it will just be debate. If we never see it again, I think it will be debated as a, as a, as a, what if a maybe, but if we see three or four, five, six stories of eight pages and it becomes a cracker of a story, it will become pa- canon. But if it's, if they're dud stories, it will then just get trashed. The good thing about it being canon is it is always and forever will be in the future because yeah. it's, it's set in a time where they you know, human civilization has collapsed. Uh, once human civilization actually collapses, we're not reading comic books anymore. So it's always in the future, yeah, yeah. Um, no, matter, no matter when it's actually able to be published. So um, we never actually have to, to reconcile that to, to our yeah. own modern day sort of thing. And if we're fitting it with, and if we're trying to cram it in a very um, complicated lineage of the Phantom, uh, it would be like the 32nd or the 33rd Phantom at the very least. Could be, at uh, very least, that's right. It could be the 50th, yeah. 60th, you know. With yeah, the, yeah. the good thing about that is um, as long as the technology of, you know, in 2021 of USBs exists to download the personality of the, uh, of the, and that's probably the most challenging aspect. How the hell did they download uh, the personality of the 21st Phantom? Not as easy as putting his guns in a storage cabinet to uh, uh, to be displayed in the skull cove. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> um, that takes us on to, to 1894. Is there anything else you wanted to say about no. 1893? No, happy to move on. Cool, cool. So 1894 is the Rodian column. Um, and I like this, that we've we've actually got a newspaper story um, appear mid-year. We haven't waited for a... Uh, uh, a Christmas special to see it. Let's uh, let's have a look at the cover first. And this is, again, it's a wraparound spread, probably an argument to say we should be including the wraparounds in our favourite cover of the year type uh, voting. But this is by Alex Tripper, Alex Trukowski, I think, Trukowski, um, from Australia. Um, thoughts on the cover, Germ? You, you wanted action packed before. There's a lot of action on this one. Yeah, I, I really like um, Alex's work. He's, he's a young guy, like he's like, I think he's like 
late twenties or early thirties. So it's yeah. like. Yeah. He's a pr- he's a proper young guy, not like <laughs> in the phantom world where someone not a pretend can, one like you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Someone can still be in their forties and still be classified as a young person in the yeah. phantom world. He's a proper young person. Yeah. Um, I, and I like how through a getting different artists, he's an Australian artist, he's a younger artist. Um, I think it's good because when he goes out and shows it, when there is that supernova, which he was, and all these other type of things. He's, in a sense, he's ambassadoring the Phantom to the next generation, and yeah. I think that's important. Um, Can I just say I really love his wolf, the the devil on the front cover, the action of that wolf, yeah. you know, jumping through the air into attack. Uh, he's ferocious, and, and the action in in the, 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 the way the body's wrapped around, love it, just mm. love it. And he's an he's an actual he actually looks like a wolf. He doesn't look like a German Shepherd or a, or a puppy dog. You yep. know, Devil is a you know he's a scary wolf. And yep. when you see a real wolf in action, eating, fighting, and stuff like that, it it will and it does send shivers down your spine. Mm. All right. So um, so then we uh, we enjoy the cover, but let's get into the story itself. Yeah, did you how, how closely were you able to follow the Rodian column when it was being published day by day as a uh, in the daily newspapers or on Comics Kingdom? Um, to be honest, I don't remember it too much. Um, I remember reading bits and pieces of it and stuff like that. Um, it's a it's an enjoyable story, but it's it's a different type of story where the Phantom is can't like. He, it's from almost like a different perspective in, in a lot of the story where it's the, from the perspective of the bad guys and the Phantom's kind of, you know, we're not seeing it. We're not seeing the story through the Phantom's eyes or, 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 or something like that. I like that. Um, I thought the colour was good in majority of the panels. And this is a partially a problem, and I will get to this when we talked about the... Um, the drummer special is that sometimes when you're talking about paper quality like this, when it's in color, it doesn't always come across good. And some of the dark colors can look a little bit muddy. Um, yeah. Well, look, certainly some of the, cause Mike Manley obviously colors this for comics kingdom. Um, and uh, the actually, new no, no, it, does he, or I thought it was comics. I thought it was actually KFS that color. Sorry, you're right. Mike Manley is the artist, obviously, but it's colored by someone at KFS. Um, and the the best example of how this is bad. So the worst example, I suppose, for me is the top of page seven, and I'll hold that up. But um, the the top line of page seven in this book. You've you've really got to stop and look at that because it's just so dark. The midnight blue right across everything has made this a really dark panel to see, um, which you know it's it's night time and that's what they're depicting it. Um, but the, certainly the blues as they've been used for the website have not come across really well yeah. in the comic book. And then you know you look at something like pages ten and eleven, which is all that color. Yeah. Um, and suddenly you've got a bit of a challenge on your hands. That said, I think I still rather have it in colour yes. than the black and white. Yes, I agree with that. Um, mm-hmm. It's just, and I think this is Fru's, you know, Fru have done what, maybe 20 coloured issues. Um, and I think they're still learning how to do colour on this paper. Uh, and, you know, in some of them, you know, some of them, they look okay, and some of the panels, it just doesn't look okay. So I think it's not as easy as just, you know, and I know there's more to it than this, but just slapping the coloured panel on a bit of paper and it being like that. You know, maybe sometimes there needs to be a test print, lighten the, some of these panels up a little bit and stuff. But again, that's manpower and, you know, yeah. through. Is that, and that said, you know, I've I've thought for a while now, and I'm not sure if I have said it on the podcast or not, but it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a running ja- joke about the Phantom being purple and and how is that actually camouflage? I think that this story shows how effective purple might actually be as a camouflage in the jungle because if you're sticking to the shadows, then the the purple is going to go dark and blend in with shadows really well, and um, the Phantom obviously is someone who sticks to the shadows. 
Um, yeah. So for you know, for me, maybe it is the the paper quality, but it really highlights what a um, and and again, well, it's not just the paper quality. A lot of it is Mike Manley's artistry because he did yeah. draw in. And I know because if Stephen was with us on the podcast today, he'd be <laughs> raving about a particular. Uh, he's got a piece of the original art from this, which he loves because of the the dappled colours in it. But the way that Mike Manley has drawn the shadows, particularly of leaves through moonlight on the Phantom's outfit, and this is it was page it was fourteen. Pretty, sorry, page fourteen. Yeah, page fourteen is the one. Uh, yeah, I was looking at there. I did I did have that up. So that's. That's got that shadowing effect. That's not the not the page of Stevens. No. But, uh, here it is. Here on page seven, um, that uh, that particular image right there. Yeah. Is one I know Stevens a big fan of, and again, it just it's the it's the artwork of Manly, the shadows through the leaves and the Phantom's mask and the eyes and yeah, the whole thing's just um, that's really compelling. So you know, I think I think it, it goes. It, it tells us that you know what purple's not the most ridiculous camouflage um, color you could choose. Bright red, um, I would put it to you. Sorry, Brazilian friends, but uh, that's probably not so good. <laughs> um, I think a lot of it depends on like a, a, a bright a bright purple is would be just as ridiculous. Um, the dark I, purple. No, the bright. Yeah, the bright purple would be just as ridiculous as the yeah. as the bright red. Possibly the the dark purple as this um, paper lends itself to um, <laughs> has worked though. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, look, look, the story's the story's good. I like the con I like how Tony's bringing in continue. Oh, what's the word? Continuality of between yep. all of the stories and stuff like that. Um, where you know this is a point I was going to make later, but Lee Falk very rarely did that you know yeah. there's there's maybe oh, maybe five maybe ten times when there's actually a little bit of continuality in his stories i was thinking similar along similar lines as i finished this because um uh other than you know that late 70s probably the 70s period where lee fork aged the phantom and got him married and had kids and that sort of thing that was probably the greatest period of actual continuity we saw yeah. um and that was in terms of aging him as a family man um tony de paul has got his fingers in every pie as far as continuity goes you don't need to have read um, the death of Diana Palmer to enjoy this story, but if you have, you get so much more out of this out of this chapter of the of the arc. If you never read this story, you'll still enjoy the overall arc of the of the Python and all the rest of it. But um, but this fits in really well with it. I you know, yeah. it just I, I think this speaks yeah. really strongly to Tony DePaul's eye on the yeah. whole continuity of the Phantom. Yeah, um, and and really. Yeah, it really highlights his quality as a writer, I think, and someone who's, yeah. Um, yeah, really got the big, big picture in mind. Yeah, big, big picture to the 22nd Phantom, but we'll get along with that a little bit later. Should we review quite, this one? Quite possibly, quite possibly. Um, now, one of the things I liked about the uh, the writing here as well, um, or, or might have been the artwork, I'm not sure whose idea it was, but uh, it was good to see quite a number of the, uh, the villains, the Rodians, were actually females as well. So they're quite a progressive nation, Rodia, for all of their faults. Um, but, but even all of their gorillas and, uh, and murderers uh, uh, seem to be uh, equal, equal quality uh, or equal rights in the Rodian army. A lot of yeah, both well, females. Different, um, different colour as well. Different colours as yep. well. So. Yep. For a, for, so for a racist and, uh, um, you know, fascist regime, um, they're, they're, pretty, they're actually pretty equal opportunity. So... And maybe that's where it kind of fits in with the team, uh, the team Phantom Men stories, because in the team Phantom Men stories, the, um, the what do you call it, the old dictator has actually died as well. So yeah, and and, and it speaks a little bit to what T. Fogner was saying with his last podcast too. Uh, you know, lots of people can see themselves in the Phantom. Sometimes that's for good. Sometimes that's for bad. So. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask you as well about the whole Babadun character. So um, Babadun uh, has a moment at the start of the story with uh, his son Kipawa, which I really like the byplay between the Phantom and Babadun's son, where the, where the Phantom actually treats Babadun's son as if he is um, the priest already, or sorry, the, the chief already, and, and asks for his opinion and acts on it. 
Um, I would have liked maybe for us to circle back to that at the end because Babadan does come back into it. I'm not going to spoil the story for people who haven't read it yet, but Babadan does come back into the story in a way that Garan never or rarely has. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it's interesting. And, again, that just seems to be that eye on the future, and I see Kapawa perhaps coming into to future Phantom stories. Yeah. To be honest, we haven't really had... You know, the band are, are always there. They've been there for so long and all that. We haven't, we've, we've really only ever been introduced and had character development in like Guran and the main chiefs. So it's good to have further development in other band um, characters. So, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a good point. Yeah. I, I noted one of the things I really liked, and I actually looked this up because I thought this must be. Um, it just felt familiar, but the last the last panel where Babadan says, um, no one sends a warrior old friend, a warrior sends himself. I actually thought that must be a quote that uh, Tony DePaul has uh, used from somewhere, but I cannot find it on Google. So I reckon that uh, no one sends a warrior, a warrior sends himself. That needs to become an old jungle saying. Well, yeah, it's always good to have some old jungle sayings. It's all some new jungle signs. Exactly, exactly. Um, last thing I was going to say about this particular issue was um, it just felt a little weird for me opening up, and it's a newspaper story, so I, I could get it completely, but uh, you open it up and boom, you're straight into the story. There's no title panel or, or even a half-page title panel, which we often see with the, the newly commissioned stories. What would you think about, so page 34, the last page finishes with a half page ad what if we had shuffled the whole comic backwards a couple of a uh, couple of columns or rows um and had a title panel you know a commissioned title panel to go yeah in front of that's, that's a good point actually um oh, that's that's actually a very good i would rather that than an advert me too me too um, and i know that through don't have to pay for the ad and if anything you know the ad works as selling their cards for them but I wonder how much it would have cost to commission Mike Manley, the author of this story, to do a title panel, uh, just a half pager, or or even just a, a local young art, up and coming artist saying, "Look, you know, okay," because I'm sure they get inundated with um, with you know young artists saying, "Oh, look, I want to do some work, I want to do some work, I want to do some work," and so it's yeah. like, "Well, okay, before we give you a cover, I want a you know, I want a, a splash intro panel, half page." Here's yeah. the story. Give me something, you know, and then and then if they do a good job of that, then you can give them a cover and, mm. and that stuff would be like cool that, to so. see what um, if that was just put out to a group of artists, what they what yeah. what uh, one of them could generate. Yeah. Cool, cool. All right. Anything else on uh, the Rodian column? No, I reckon let's move on. This is going to be a good one. This one, but might also take a while. A percussion of drums. You've already held it up. So it's 1895. A percussion of drums is the uh, the catch-all title. It's four drummers of timpani stories, which um, which is pretty cool. Um, I'll just hold up the back there so you can see it. But um, we've got uh, the original Fork Barry story, which uh, Dudley is very quick to point out is not a very recent reprint because not many people will have purchased the uh, uh, the signature or sorry the blank the blank cover sketch cover copy. Um, so it is a long time since the drummer of Timpani story came out and it's in color this t in, in this issue for the first time ever. We've also got the Swedish sequel, which has been published by Fru, but again, not since, uh, well, not for over 30 years. Uh, Revenge of the Drummer it came out from uh, Team Funderman. Uh, then there's a Brazilian, it's called on the back cover, it says the Brazilian continuation. I probably question the word continuation there, but we can discuss that. Um, but it's certainly a drummer of Timpani story from Brazil called Revolt in the Jungle. And then specially commissioned for this particular issue is an, uh, an Andrew Constant um, and uh, uh, Tadaro, Angela. Angelo Tadaro is the artist. Um, legacy of the drummer. So a, a final sort of wrap up story. And as it proudly proclaims there on the back cover, all in color. So 108 pages of uh, colored fruit. Who would have thought we'd ever see it? Yeah. Look, I, so far, this is the issue of the year. Um, you know, there's some <laughs> issues or some concerns I have with <laughs> with the um, actual comic, but 
you know, besides that, it's got four, or it's got two good, two great classic stories, and it's got two very competent, very good stories, and it's it's all it's all with the one theme. Um, you know, the stories sort of fit together, like the 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 Brazilian story sort of doesn't fit as well but i can live with that um and you know to be honest they were never really intended to be printed together you know one was in south america the other one was in um you know sweden you know they're, they're, yeah. they're you know literally you know the, the opposites in so many in so many um facets you know one's the jungle or one's you know snow so <laughs> and um, and the brazilian the brazilian story was actually written and produced in 1981 7 years before the team fantaman story so you could almost argue that it's the team fantaman story that hasn't fit in the continuity uh in that sense but um that certainly in terms of the brazilians never picking up on and, and, and the order that Frill have put them in here, one, two, three, four, is not the order that they were uh, written or produced. And as you say, never actually meant to go together. Yeah. It was only two years difference. It was Revenge of the Drummer was a 1983, but still the point remains. 1988 published in Fru. So it's uh, Jim Shepard's fault that I'm a liar. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I, like, I like how it's in colour. Um, you know, Ivan's, you know, I, I, so I, Ivan Peterson, who has colored, has um, colored the, three of the four stories. Yes. So he's colored, uh, the original daily story by Cy Barry, the, uh, team phantom End story. And then also the last story where the, um, revolt in the jungle was originally printed in color as well. Now yep. I think he's done, I think he's done a, a good job. I'd, I don't think he's done an excellent job overall. And I think there is a reason for that, which is very similar as what we said before that the paper doesn't tend to um, portray darker panels. And let's be honest, a lot of this happens at night in all three, in all the three stories. So I think some of it hasn't quite transferred as well because, and I, and, I, and I don't think that's so much as, as Ivan's fault. I think that's, you know, and, you know, this is not me having a go at Ivan or anything like that. Me and Ivan have actually talked about this in private as well. Um, I think, you know, because like you look at some of these first two pages where it's happening during the day, the panels look quite well. But in some of them where, you know, it's, it's at night, they look a little bit muddy, but Again, I think that's very similar as what we discussed in the um, Rodeo and Colin. Yeah, uh, I think it was probably um, those those midnight blues in particular in the Rodeo and Colin were probably harder to see than um, than what's happening in this story. I, I um, it's a uh, I, it, it's not. A, I, don't, I don't know enough about art to explain exactly where the colours are. It's not bright. It's not pastel. It's somewhere in between. Yeah. Like it's a dark pastel, perhaps. And I don't think it's a deal breaker. No, agreed. And uh, absolutely not. I, as I say, I think the colouring was uh, made the Rodian column harder to read than this one. I think where this one and and you've highlighted um, uh, panels from the first story, it's Cy Barry's Drummer of Timpani. I think what I would like to have seen with that one is the panels be bigger sizes because I, I think it yeah. suffers from smaller panels more than it suffers from yeah. from colours. I think the, so, the smaller panels are, are what yeah. makes it. And I've got a theory about this. So for those who are on um, uh, YouTube, I'm going to hold up a sketch a sketch cover and then the new one. So let's see if how this goes um, for those on YouTube. It's... Not so basically for those who are on audio, I'm holding up the two comics. And as you can tell in the sketch comma, which is the top one, they're doing basically three panels per page, and then the fourth one is um has been um dropped on the second line. Where if you're looking on on the colored one, which is the one that I'm moving now, you can see that is basically all three of those, you know, all four of those panels are on the one line. And you're so, right. 
so on the side on the coloured one in the in this issue 1895, what I'm looking at is 16 panels per page, four across, four down. Yeah. What's it like in the the sketch cover? So in the sketch it's cover, three across, see, four down. Yeah. Yeah, that that I think that makes that's a significant difference, and and maybe it yeah. comes down to page count and what the influence overall on that. But for me, I, I yeah. it's a shame that it wasn't bigger panels. Now, I I believe that's what it is. Now, if in an ideal world, and we know an ideal world does not exist because there's COVID, there's life, there's you know everything like that. But in an ideal world, this would have been best as a trade paperback because you could have had. These panels a little bit bigger. Um, you could have had maybe uh, where is it? I still think that sometimes um, I, I think they've done it well in here where they've put the fruit issue in between the pages. Yeah, um, the some cover. of them, yeah, the fruit covers. Some sometimes they could be they could feel a little bit jammed together. Yeah. Um, and then with the with this one, the Brazilian I'll, with the Brazilian one. Now I didn't have a problem with it reading it, having to turn it the other way. But if they if it was a trade paperback, and in a sense page size isn't much of a concern, instead of having to flip it and having two pages on one page, you could have had one page per one page and not having to flip it. And, and all in the portrait. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I, we'd need someone else who's clever and has got more time than us to do the maths that if that drummer of timpani story had been expanded to the same page dimensions as the sketch cover and then the Brazilian took twice as many pages because, as you've said, we've fitted two portraits onto a landscape, whereas if you turned it and, um, and had it all as portrait arrangement... Um, I, I think the story would benefit because the the pictures are bigger. We're enjoying them more. Yeah. So that would that would stretch it out. You'd think to 150 plus pages as a as a group of four. But like you say, as a trade paperback, um, you're far more, and you're probably willing to pay um, 25 dollars instead of the 12 dollars 50 that this one cost. Yeah. So I've just done a quick look in the sketch cover, which is the one that I'm holding up now, where the panels are, are three by four as we discussed it ends on page 30 where yep. on the issue 1895 it ends on page 24 so and I've, that's with it only starting on page four because um yeah. because of the covers. So, so let's say seven seven pages yeah. that you save by squishing um now now that's that's been very pedantic you know, we've we've kind of said, "Oh, we love this issue," and then we've like criticised it for the gone last straight five for the minutes. bits we don't like. <laughs> Typical Australian style. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, all the negatives aside, which we've discussed about everything else, I love this. I love how they've. I know some people might not like this, but I like how they've um, reused original um, Sparta covers. For those who don't know that the front and the back and if you're on youtube again i will have them i will show them they are actually different um uh being used before and they've been recolored um I, I like that i like the covers um you know and um yeah what, what do you think about it because did you pick that up straight away Look, when I and, I, and I think I put this in the chat group, I've probably already sent this in a message to Dudley, actually. One of the, when I first picked this up, I saw the covers, saw the, the list of stories on the back. I read through the message from the publisher, had a flick through each of the stories, and immediately I was like, wow, this is probably one of the, my favourite comics of the year so far. Um, I, probably, I probably lowered that estimation after I actually read it without, without any disrespect to... Uh, this, probably because I was I had had my expectations brought so high, um, and as you said, there's uh, the first two stories I think are, are excellent, and you can really tell the Team Fantaman story has been like Drummer of Timpani. I think is one of Lee Fork and Cy Barry's better collaborations. I think I it's I, I would hold it up there as one of I'm not going to say top ten, top twenty. I don't know, but it's certainly I, one of my I favorite. Would. I would. Yeah, it's certainly one of my favorite Lee Fork. Uh, stories, uh, particularly with Cy Barry, um, the Team Farnham and crew, and I've and I'm well on the record as having issues with some of the work that they've done, but they've tailored this into the Lee Fork story really, really well. 
Um, the the Brazilian one um, is good. Is one of the better Brazilian stories I've read. Yep. Uh, didn't fit in with that continuity, which is which I guess would have been nice, um, but highly unachievable. Um, <laughs> and then the and then the Andrew Constant um, and uh, Angelo Todaro story at the end. Uh, look, I. I, I I probably was looking forward to the drummer coming back. Um, in hindsight, yep. the legacy of the drummer, what came after the drummer, I, you know, I should have probably picked up on that. But I, I really like the drummer as a character. I like his long, thin face and um, the character that he is. So for him to not actually appear personally in the last story was, um, I, I'll, I'll need to read it again going in knowing that he's not there, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, the main reason is because, you know, in the... Um uh, Team Phantom in story, he gets eaten by. A, he well, does get killed. It's, yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it's implied that he gets killed. Yeah, and I have and I have put a note here that I think that, uh, and we've said before about um, great baddies or great villains in the Phantom not having a recurring. Um, that's because so many of them get killed off, <laughs> or, or, or they they uh, yeah the the ones where they just go to prison forever. That's okay because you can break them out again. But uh, yeah. yeah, it's a shame that they killed the drummer off. Norman Worker, you're a great author, but uh, I probably I wish you hadn't done that. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we don't actually technically we don't see his body, and that's but, why uh, I thought I thought after I read that, oh wow, they're going to find a way to ride him back out. He swam out of the yeah. swamp and he's uh, pretended. Now, <laughs> have you noticed? That on the front and bad uh, front and back cover, he doesn't have his goatee. Uh, I was probably um, uh, I didn't really pick up on that. What I did pick up on the front cover was that Phantom didn't wear his rings. Um, so that's probably <laughs> <laughs> I was focused on that rather than the the drummer's goatee. But you're right. <laughs> yeah. Um, look, I. I, I think it's I think it's a great issue. Um, I you know the the like we said the Lee Fork story is one of my all time favourite stories. The Team Fansman story is probably is one of their better ones. Um, you know, it's still got that family element, but it's got the the, the darker, edgier element. So I think that that kind of appeals to both people. You're right about the Brazilian story. It you know the colours is amazing. Yes, it's 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 a, it's a, it's a great you know it's a great um I really enjoyed I enjoyed the story. Um, yeah, I mean, there's some plot holes in the sense that um, they they never bother to explain, like Team Phantomman did about being able to remake the drum and that sort of thing. Yeah, because that did get destroyed at the end of the Lee Fork tale. Yeah, so like for instance, you know this page here, which is page seventy seven where you've got the bigger panels and you've got the, you know, you've got the drum noises and stuff like that. Um, you know, that, you know, that's, it's, it's classic. It's, it's straight out of the, the Lee Fork story. Um, it is. And they, and they've got a very Barry-esque artist on yes. the Brazilian as well, which, um, which I really liked. Um, and I, I, forgive me. I haven't it is up. Walmill um, Mariola, who, um, who's, is actually still alive and he, and, um, he does do commissions and that you can start, he's been doing some stuff like that, uh, that you can buy is, and all that. Has he well. got a sketch cover on the way to his house at the moment, Jim? Uh, to be or honest, is actually, one already I've back? actually got two already. <laughs> uh, I liked it so much. I, I did one and I liked it so much that I went and brought another one. Um, he did Phantoms World 8, I believe it is. Right. Um, yep. So yeah, so um, yeah, so for those who want to learn a bit about him, uh, he's he's probably the what would you say? He would be the most recognisable or the most popular phantom Brazilian artist. Yeah, yeah. Um, and look, as a as a story, that was a lot. It was a lot of fun. And it's as I say, I love this character. It was great to revisit him again. So so again, that was a, probably why I was a little oh, and. I, the, I take your point about the art and particularly those full pages or what would have been full pages if we'd seen them rotated and um, spread out in a trade paperback, for instance. Um, it, it would have been awesome to see those. Yeah. Um, now, even even um, Andrew Constant and uh, um, Angelo's story, I, I didn't mind it. Like, you know, the, again, there's, there's things, there's the big panels, there's, mm. you know, there's Diana plays an important part of it, Graham plays an important part. Uh, you've got the big boom, 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 booms. Um, you know, you've got the mysteriousness and all that. The one thing that kind of 
I had to reread was was the bad guy, the drummer, is like I'm reading it and I'm going, do I know this guy? And then and then I'm reading it and then, you know, like he talks about how he was captured and then I'm going, hang on, have I missed something? Have I have I missed the Phantom story? Have they like forgotten to put a little caption of what story he's appeared in? It, and... they ma- Andrew made that up, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah. But yeah. it just it just caught me for a little bit, and I'm like, hang on, I got to stop reading this, and I got to like go back from the beginning and reread yep. it, and 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 so is yeah. that because you were also half expecting the drummer himself to turn up? I wasn't expecting the drummer because, as far as I'm concerned, he's dead as in the yep. Team Phantom End story. Oh, we can write those things back out again. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you know, you, you look at it, all the Batman villains have died a million times as well. So, yep. um, but it, it just it just threw me a little bit um, trying to, you know, at first I'm like, oh, Andrew's brought back an old villain. And then I'm like, but who is he? I don't remember this guy. There's no reference. And it, 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 it caught me out a little bit. I had to then go back and pay a little bit more attention. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that's an Andrew problem. I think that's more of a me problem. But it's just... yeah, <laughs> in the same way that me reading a title called "The Legacy of the Drummer" and still somehow thinking the drummer was going to turn up—that's a me problem. That's not an Andrew problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. yeah, you know, and I enjoy Ang- uh, Angelo's work. Uh, he's he's done a lot of uh, Sparta stories as well. He's been featured uh, quite well, not quite heavily, but. He's been featured in um, some of the Phantoms World um, series as well. Yeah. I think that the, the panel, and I, I'd hate to keep harping back on this, but the panel difference is, is significant. So if I, if I hold this up, I'm looking at pages 86 and 87, and even on the screen, I imagine you can see all of that pretty clearly as I hold it up. If I flip back all of a sudden back to pages 6 yeah. and 7, you know, that we're talking about 10 panels on a, on a spread versus 32. And the the difference in the way that that makes the book look and the advantages that, um, you know, because I think the colouring, for instance, i got no qualms about the colouring in the last story, but it's all, it's so much bigger and spread out again. So that's, it really does highlight for me the, the impact that the smaller panels had. Yeah. And I reckon that's why it would have been, it would have been amazing to see this as a trade paperback. Um, be interesting to see what see what they would could have done with that because maybe that you know we talked about six or seven extra pages for the drummer of timpani story what if you were able to stretch it out to an extra eight or ten pages and, and the, the size you could make them then yeah and so if we're looking at the brazilian story it ends at 80 and it's quite a long story actually mm. and it begins at 60 or 20 pages so you could have been so if you it did have to be 40 40 pages you've 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 got an extra six or seven pages with the first story yeah. um so you know that's 50 pages so it would have you know it would have been a small trade paperback at like 160 pages you might have been able to spread it to yeah. 170 180 having an article maybe or some you know you know an introduction oh, the, the, yeah. the team phantom cover for instance from the from yeah this story that's not in here that could have that could have been added um, the so you could, make... yeah. So all what you could do is you could have like a gallery of all the different covers of um, the drummer of Timpini and all these other ones throughout the yeah. years. So you know there could be another ten. So now you're looking at 180 pages. Yeah. Would would people prefer a 180 page, 200 page trade paperback and pay you know 25, 30 dollars, or would have they preferred 108 pages? At you know twelve fifty half yeah. the price. I tell you what it, it what it does do. The fact that we're talking about it, oh gee, could it have been a trade paperback? It will have to be in conversation at the end of the year for regular issue of the year from oh, through. It is so f- for me so far. This is the issue of the year from from forever. There you go. Well, that um, on that note, let's move on to, and I don't actually have it on me, that my giant size 17 uh, has just come out. So, Jim, if you want to perhaps take us through, I must have left that at my reading desk. You want to take us? <laughs> All right. So this is uh, giant size number 17. Um, now, our next podcast after the A and B is actually going to be with the cover artist, uh, Glenn Lumsden. And in that podcast, which we did record prior, he actually talks about this cover. Um, so 
Now, the reason that's been delayed is for a couple of reasons, mainly editorial reasons, um, purely with, you know, with, um, with King Features, with the future, and then we were like, oh, crikey, we better do a comics and news one. Um, so that's the reason why that's been delayed. But this is the cover here. Um, Glenn does amazing covers as per normal. We're pretty much used to them. Um, now, I, I will admit, I, I like Giant Size. I'm a, I'm a fan of Giant Size. Um, I didn't think I was going to be a fan of them. But I wish there would have been a bit more phantom content in this 228 pages. Um, I just think that one story, which is, you know, the game by Bill Harris and Bill Ling Ling Lingnan, which is a, a copy of a Lee Fork story, um, I just feel it doesn't, it doesn't quench my thirst as a phantom fan first and foremost. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I agree. But um, this this series of books is not targeted at Phantom yep. Fans Force and Firmus, is it? It's targeted at um, Australian comics fans and people who are loving that nostalgia of going through their Catmans and their Planet Mans and, and whatever. Um, yeah. No, you're right. So, yep. oh, it's at the bottom. What am I talking about? Um what it, what it did make me do, I, this is the first time I think I've re read that version of Ragon's game because, again, um, I'm not someone who's gone through and been able to collect, the in this case, the Gold Key, which was the um, start of the, that run, Gold Key, Charlton, and... Um, uh, oh, mental blank. What was the third one? Uh, Gold Key, King, and then Charlton. King, that's right. So um, I'm not someone who's gone through and collected those original or those early American comics, um, so this is the first time I've read that. It certainly made me go back and um, I picked out uh, 1786 and here's something that a, uh, a replica series is good for because Ragon's Game, the original by Wilson McCoy and Lee Fork was in there. Um, so I had a quick read of it after I'd read the, uh, the, the Gold Key version, um, Bill Harris's version. Um, it was entertaining to see just how many of uh, Lee Fork's lines um, had come across and how many hadn't. Um, and I thought there was some gaps in the uh, in the Charlton story that they they certainly um, told probably two thirds of the story from the Lee Fork Wilson McCoy and some of the editorial changes were were perfectly fine. A couple of them, particularly at the end of the story, I thought left a because it, it finished the the giant size finished very very suddenly. Um, turns out there's a whole epilogue type thing that's in the Lee Fork story that they didn't bring across. Um, but that's fine. I didn't uh, up front. I didn't even go through and read the rest of the, the giant size. Um, Did you see um, uh, Bill draws the Phantom Eyes again? It's a number of times that you can see the Phantom's eyes. Actually, there's that one that you're holding up there. Um, there was also as he's going up the cliff on page thirty. I'm probably holding over the top of it. Uh, as he's going over the cliff on page thirty-three, you see his eyes in that one as well. So um, Bill didn't mind putting the Phantom's eyes through the mask, yeah. did he? and it must be said, let me say this again, and we've said it on our social media and, and previously, Bill was not, and I repeat, he was not sacked for drawing the Phantom's eyes in the Queen Samara story. That is a rumour that was um, uh, started in the 90s and um, made famous by being included in a Malin diary um, which they got from Jim Shepard. And I know who Jim Shepard got the rumour from, and that is not correct. And that's been confirmed by um, Cy Barry when we interviewed him. He actually said that he's, he's, re he's confirmed that that was actually a, an incorrect rumour. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, and again, having had uh, issue one, uh, episode 191 with T. Fugner, I'd wonder uh, if that's something that King Features would have even picked up as it went through. <laughs> Uh, at the time, clearly not. I doubt. Uh, so, what, what it, you know, as I say, I read through this and it made me want to pick up, and, and I did go up, uh, pick up the the old Ragon's game and and do a comparison. What did you think of Giant Size Seventeen as a as an issue, as a representation of the Phantom? You probably already alluded to that a little bit. Yeah. Um. Look, I'm, you know, as a and you know, this is a Phantom podcast. I'm a Phantom fan. You know, first and foremost. I would have liked to seen, you know, a, you know, a new part or something from 
you know, um, Shane Foley or Glenn Lumsden and, you know, just, you know, crossing over with some of these other characters, whether it was, um, you know, uh, Planet Man, Catman, the Shadow, Sir Franklin, one of these other guys, I would have, I would have liked that. I can understand you can't always do it for every single issue, but um, this Phantom fan wants that for every issue. Yeah. Yeah. And, and look, it's interesting um, going through, um, and again, Australian comics aficionados and, and historians are going to love mm. the sort of detail that Glenn Ford's providing in his message from the publisher. There's a bit of a story about um, Planet Man number two, which is published in this, but was already published in Giant Size yeah. 13. And, um, you know, the, the difficulties that there are in uh, trying to yeah. find all of these old copies again. And even the, the owners of Fru are struggling to find the comics that Fru published 60, 70 years ago. So it's entertaining uh, reading through that. And in, and in that sense, he's certainly doing a, um, a service to Australian comics yeah. publishing history by reproducing these and, uh, and making them available for people to read. Yeah, and there's a lot of Australian fans, comic, oh, comic fans, sorry, a lot of Australian comic fans that are really digging the giant size 17. You know, Absolutely. They, they, they love it. You know, I, I see it crop up on um, various uh, comic forums and stuff like that, you know. And to be honest, I've even spotted a few non-Australians that, you know, talk about how this is good because, it, you know, brings all these classic stories and stuff like that. Uh, I'm sure if uh, Anthony Gillies had his way, we might even see a couple of uh, Australian romance um, comics that were published by Fru to be included. Um um, so I'm, I'm sure I'm sure Anthony's I'm sure he's uh, quite um, uh, you know tr trying to get that across the line. Nice little shout out there. <laughs> um, so um, you know if you if you're an Australian comics fan and you've got and particularly I'm reading from the the, the cover the front page here, um, Glenn would love to hear from you if you've got issues. Uh, of Planet Man, Invisible Avenger, which I've never even heard of, Jet Man and the Green Skeleton. He's after issues one through to four of each of those. So Jet Man and Green Skeleton, again, have you ever heard of them? No. No. <laughs> no. So um, I do have the uh, From Sunbeams to Sunset book here somewhere. I'm sure they're listed. I could go and look it up if I wanted to, but I'll uh, hang on to maybe giant size 18 or 19 where hopefully someone's been able to ring up Glenn and say, Hey, I have a copy of one of those. Do you want to scan? So, yeah, yeah. Um, and, there, and there's been a lot of fans that do that. Um, yeah. You know, like in talking to Glenn and he says, you know, he gets people um, contacting me and saying, Oh, I've seen you've been doing giant size. I've got this, this, and this. Did you want to scan or did you want to buy it or, or, or whatever? And, you know, um, and they're quite good. Like I, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I know Fru have actually paid for scans yep. um, of a comic and stuff like yeah, that. So th they're serious about this. They're serious about, um, you know, not just phantom history, but uh, Australian comic history. And I think it's smart because it's, you know, we've talked about it before, but it's diversifying Fru's income in a sense. Yeah, so Fru, you know, because a lot of this stuff, they don't have to pay royalties and, you know, and and stuff like that. They don't have to, you know, go through all the rigmaroles of, you know, getting approved by by King Features and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So it's it will probably be easier to do a giant size in in some sense. Absolutely. Okay, so giant size down. Let's move. That that catches up finally with all of the fruit comics um, over the the last little while. Um, and um, we don't have. Uh, we're going to insert some other stuff from uh, from Mikhail Lick in a moment. But before we do that, one of the bits of feedback we have received here at Chronicle Chamber is that people would like to hear us uh, talking about the the daily and the Sunday stories. And uh, I guess because they are um, available on Comics Kingdom and and up kept up to date that way and published in the newspapers every day, this is something that could be relevant or would be relevant is relevant to people from all over the world. So we're going to bring that into the comics and news. We at one stage tried to keep a tabs on when the story is finished and let's talk about them as they finish. But I think it's, it's just going to be a lot easier if we just have a running spot in the Comics and News podcast where we talk about progress to date um, and where are we at right now with the Daily and the Sundays. So I'm actually looking forward to bringing this, uh, bringing this in, June. Yeah, and I guess, it, you know, you listeners, in a sense, we talked about, you know, us fans owning the Phantom. You know, you listeners... Uh, dictate what we do in a lot of ways. Um, 
you know, use, use, you know, we put it out there and it was like, I reckon it was 95% said, yeah. yes, let's do it. So yeah. it's kind of like, well, let's do it. Yeah. Uh, it. It might mean the podcasts are longer, but well, all, you know, you've asked for it. So, so be it. And it'll be interesting because it'll keep us a little bit more honest. We sort of touched on it when we talked about the Rodian column. The dailies and the Sundays, the dailies in particular, the Sundays I tend to read every Sunday. The yeah. dailies probably I'm a little bit more hit and miss and I might see only two out of every five or six, yeah. you know, and you can keep up to date with the story. But certainly there were panels in the Rodian column I don't remember seeing when it was getting published as a daily. Um, so it's going to be, we're certainly not going to be as precise when we talk about the Sunday and the daily because we may not be 100% up to speed. Um, you, you do tend to catch up with it most days, Jim. Um, again, yeah, probably the Sunday I, I see. Um, the daily is, I, th- I think it depends on how good the story is. Mm. Yeah, um, certainly reckoning with the nomad that really drew us in, and we were looking yeah. forward to each each day. And and but not every story is as um, yeah. as compelling as that. Like the Sunday story, which we're about to rev- we're about to discuss, that's got me. You know, every Sunday morning, like seeing seeing what it is. So yeah. I, I must admit, I got no idea where Tony's going with this story. Like, okay, um, so this is the, this the is the visitor. visitor. And yes. just to give a quick summation, really quick summation, basically um, there's the um, there's some hint of a phantom doppelganger. People keep seeing, seeing ghosts or images of the phantom when they know he's out of the woods or he's, he's in another forest or whatever it might be. Um, and so now we're going back into the into the uh, the vault, into the chronicle chambers uh, to to read through past chronicles and to find out other times where this doppelganger has appeared. Um, we did as part of this story. Um, this is pretty exciting. There's a new addition to the Skull Cave, which the Phantom even, you know, is almost breaks the fourth wall in a sense to say, hey, no, there is a new chamber in the Skull Cave and I've been redesigning it um, where he's putting up past Phantom costumes. And for the first time, and Jeff Weigel's exploring this in a magnificent way, may I say, we're having a look at what realistically might have been the Phantom's outfit in the 1700s, in the 1800s, as fashion changed, as design changed, as materials available changed. So uh, we see that uh, that hall of costumes, so to speak. I'm not sure if we've got an actual name, but that's what I'm calling it. Um, and when we're still at the stage, and I think we're probably eight or nine weeks into the Sunday now, we're still trying to find out where the story's going. Are you enjoying it so far? I am. I am. I've enjoyed the, the new Skull Cave edition, as we talked about. Um, I think it's it's got me, and I know there's a lot of other fans on the edge of their seats, going, "What? Where is this going? What is it? Is it a doppelganger? Is it a, you know, is it a long-standing joke from the Sons of the Phantom playing tricks on their old man or something like that? You know, what, what's what's going on? Um, you know, is it? You know, the options are endless. I just hope." we don't go down the path of alternative universes and stuff like that. That, in my opinion, that belongs with DC and Marvel. I, you know, if Tony goes there, he will get an, he will get an email from me. Uh, I'd be really surprised if that's where Tony's going. I can't see. Um, That had never even occurred to me, to be honest. That's how little I think that he's going down that path. Mm. But but I'm like you, I've got no idea where this is going and, it's certainly at the moment bringing in a ghostly element to the ghost of walks. So I've got no problem with that. Um, yeah, but but for the most part, and we've said this number of times on the podcast over its 192 versions, um, the Phantom is a is a character that is set in the real world. So most things tend to have uh, a, a an explainable um, explanation for for one yeah. the term um, or a rational explanation. So except except old man Moz, you know, he's now a mystic. Most things, as I said. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, I have, interesting yeah. to see where it's going. Yeah. One thing that I find interesting with the um, uh, the the old-style costumes is does the Phantom still have his eyes whited out? Because, in, the old, yeah, in all of the old-style costumes he yeah, has had, because, even though they're yeah, in, rough. In, in today's world... And in the future, you can probably come up with material that would have the white and be able to see through it like a two-way mirror. But back in the 1600s, I don't know how you'll go with that. So it's um, kind of like we've, we've, we've gone realistic. And I think 
Jeff's done an amazing job with that. But uh, is there still that element of it's just a comic where we're still having the whites, uh, mm. uh, what or the eyes whited? The eyes whited out. So. And, and I'm okay with that. Maybe that was Bill Legandy's uh, explanation, though, when he, he was drawing older comics. So, um, interesting, talking about the eyes, I once asked Graham Nolan this question, uh, and this was when he showed the Phantom's eyes, and his, his comment was, I showed that because this was when he just got blown up by um, the Python when they first met. And he said, I showed it because... We were in the inner sanctum. We're like a fly on the wall and the phantom is vulnerable and it shows the phantom's vulnerability because we see him unmasked, injured mm. and being cared by the uh, the bander and Diana. Mm. Mm. No, it's an interesting one and different, and different artists will have their own take on it as they go through. But uh, yeah, it's uh, what are we, uh, it's Saturday night as we're recording this. So looking forward to tomorrow's iteration to, to see if yeah. that uh, uh, gets us gets us moving. Now, in terms of the dailies, um, since our last comics and news, and, and we'll include it in this one, we've seen the conclusion of daily, uh, the daily Hello to the Himalayas. Now, um, this is, I guess, the counterpoint to the story Kit's Letter Home from a little while ago, um, which was the shortest ever Phantom Daily story, um, which was a story of um, Kit sending a letter or burning a letter before he sent it to to get sent home to the Skull Cave. This one, Hello to the Himalayas, was, I guess, uh, as I say, the bookend, if you like. Heloise writing her letter to go back to um, to. It's Kit. a great and touch. It's a great touch. It was touch. Re- really well done and, and equally short. So um, this is now the second shortest Phantom well, Daily story. As equal a, first. Equal first. So they're both exactly the same. That, and that's nice in itself as well. Yeah. And I reckon, I reckon Tony did that again. To, I reckon he did that on purpose. Because, like, you know, it, like, when um when we talk to him, he goes, you know, I'm creating the shortest Phantom story, you know, like so he he knows this, and I so I reckon he's he's timed it perfectly, so that way you've got Kit and Heloise writing letters, and they're the equal shortest. He's done yeah. it on purpose. Oh, oh of course, yeah, I hadn't realised that. Yeah, no doubt he he's too smart a man to suddenly have done yeah, that yeah. by coincidence. Yeah, I like this story because it keeps Kit fresh in everyone's mind because at the moment kits he's out of sight out of mind potentially yeah yeah yeah. and just having these little snippets every so often just kind of like oh yeah kit but i also like now heloise had always bugged me huh. but she had always bugged me but i'm i'm actually really enjoy the the development of the character of Halloween since the reckoning of the nomad and mm. you know and then you've got the story when um oh when um Cardia sees her mum again you know Kit diffused that situation uh Halloween's diffused that situation and then you've got this and stuff like that. She's she's becoming and we've said I've said this a million times, but she's becoming more phantom like and I'm liking her as a character more and more than what I ever used to. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, look, I think um, the development of Eloise as a character is, is really appealing. And uh, in a sense, it's a shame that Kit is parked at the Kit Jr. has been parked at the moment. I'm looking forward to seeing what, uh, what happens with him as he comes back into, into the main story as well. Now you've, um, and, and I haven't kept up to date with the, with the um, correspondence going back and forth, but you've had some uh, some good chats with Tony DePaul about this story um, over the over the last little while. Yeah. Now, um, so what? So a little bit of history. Um, the good guys in Phantom Wiki put that Kit was in Tibet, and then Tony emailed me back and saying, "Oh, can you change that?" And I said. So he's not in Tibet, you know, and he goes, no, but you're about to find out where he is. So um, in this story, we find out that Kit is not in India. I mean, that is in India and not in Tibet. Um, now, the area is called the, the, the mountains area. And listen, if you know your ge- geographical, you've kind of got that area is a little hotbed and there's like four or five countries in that kind of, radius area so 
that's the why you would see people that look like Tibetans, why you would see people that look Chinese and stuff like that. But Tony DePaul has on purpose put Kit in the Aaron Aaron Che Chara Pradesh Mountains. Um, sorry to all our Indian friends where I butchered that. Um, and he's put him in those mountains uh, because he's actually got some uh, friends in India um, who do a, an annual mo- uh, motorbike trek in those mountains. And so it's kind of his nod to them because he's never actually been able to do it um, uh, himself. And so it's kind of like his way of, 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 of doing that. So, um, yeah, so I, I think that will, I think that it will intrigue and uh, put a lot of um, readers interest with that. Mm. Mm. And, and, and it's part of, and I know we're going to talk about it when we talk about the next story, particularly, but we've already mentioned it with the Rodian column as well. So we might as well bring it in here. But again, it's that continuity. Um, yeah. You know, it's almost like, okay, we're between main stories. It's a soap opera. It's a, it's a soap opera strip. Yeah. So let's have a, um, a bit of a um, letter writing, yeah. bring in the reminder of a, um, what's the, the words failing me now, but um yeah, I'll yeah. edit this bit out if you like, or, or leave it in to make me look foolish. <laughs> um, but no, you're I right. Of, I can't um, think of the word. You know, just a just a shift of scene. Let's get a little bit of a meanwhile. Let's over here. Let's see what's going on. Yeah, yeah. So um, now, because when people think of India, like, like, and this is something that Tony's actually, you know, said, I'll say, I'll, I'll read it word to word what he's wrote about Kit being in India and not Tibet. India, according to Halloween's. It's funny how some readers are too lazy to do their own research before commenting. Um, you wouldn't be able to tell photos of Tibet and far north and northeastern India apart, which is what we discussed before. The terrain, the architecture, the people are all very similar. There are Tibetan Buddhist monasteries all over Himalaya, India, and the locals do tend to look Chinese. But when people think of India, they think of Bollywood, um, which is not always India. Now, Tony did drop a clue about the location five years ago. In Which I did not pick up on. No, I don't think anyone did. In farewell (laughs) to the deep woods, subtle as it was, and not many readers outside of India would have picked up on it, Chief Constable Jumba Jumba is actually an Indian name. It can be Tibetan, but when you hear that name, it is almost always Indian. See, that that stuff makes me go, my goodness, how good is it that we've got Tony DePaul doing yeah. this? If he's planting those sorts of seeds five years ago, he's on top of this continuity stuff. Yeah. He knows what he's doing. Lee Falk's got nothing on him when it comes to <laughs> continuity. Yeah, Lee Falk changed names from John Co to John Carr. <laughs> We, t- we talked about stewardship with uh, with T. Fugner and KFS, but it's hard to imagine someone doing a better job of being a steward of the Phantom than uh, than what Lee, uh, than, than what Tony yeah. Paul's doing at yeah. the time. He's putting he's putting Easter eggs and clues. Yeah, you know, half a decade apart Ahead from each other. <laughs> and most fans, I I don't reckon any of us actually picked up on it. No. Um, if if you did if you if someone's out there and they and you picked up on it, please let us know because I'm sure Tony would uh, be very interested and very uh, amused that someone that well, someone picked up on when, it. When when the creator is putting that much thought into it, you'd like to think you, when you're the creator, and I've and I've I'm not on anywhere near this, near this scale, but I've done things. And when you've got a little in joke that you write for yourself and you go, aha you do just want someone else to pick up on it to justify the time you've put, the thought you've put into it. Yeah. So I hope Sorry. that yes. in touch to say, oh, yeah, no, my uncle Jumper also yeah. comes from India or whatever. Sorry, Tony, <laughs> but um, no one on this podcast picked up on it. Um, just and, not that bright. <laughs> yeah, no, we're not that bright. <laughs> <laughs> All right, should we move on to the... A lot less subtle as we go into the the new daily story to rack and ruin at Gravelines. Um, I did pick up on the return of Savannah, um, and it's far less subtle. We had a, a character that I really enjoyed was involved in three or four stories um, a decade or more ago, um, and is starting to come back. We're also having references to 
um, the Diana, uh, the death of Diana Palmer story again, um, as we as we delve back into Gravelines Prison, which is a uh, uh, this would be the continuity story, isn't it? That that Tony's yeah. written over the twenty plus years that he's been involved in the Daily Strip. Now this is the the thread that he's sewing through yeah. um, all the way through. Yeah, it's the yeah, it's the continuation of the you know overarching thread. I guess if you want to look at a, a movie reference, you've kind of got the Marvel team up where you've got the uh, the Infinity Stones. You know, this is the equivalent Infinity Stones, where mm. every movie, every story, lines to that. Mm. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Yeah. And, and we're obviously only a, a little while into this into this story now. Um, again, uh, as we've said, the daily is not one that I keep up with as well. Um, I, I do look forward to it being published in a fru and, and being all there together. Um, but uh, but what do you think of the story so far? You're liking old men Moz, the involvement of Moz? You mentioned <laughs> that. Um, I've been on the record and... Um, and I have told Tony this, but I don't like Old Man Moz as a seer. He was never intended as a seer. Um, and if I had to say it, it's probably Tony DePaul's, in my opinion, worst addition to the Phantom Law. Don't tell me you're going to go all focused on me now. <laughs> um, yeah, we're going to switch roles. Um, <laughs> You're going to grow your hair and I'm going to shave it. No. <laughs> um, but no, I, I, I just don't, I, I personally don't like it. Um, I understand it and it makes sense. You know, it makes sense. I just don't like it. Um, but, you know, there's some great lines like, for instance, the, you know, the death of the 21st Phantom story where, you know, where old man Moz predicted the death of the 21st Phantom and it took, you know, Diana messing with, with the timeline and Baba Dan coming into it as, yeah. as uh, mentioned earlier, and then Old Man Moz has just said this week as we're recording, if you free Savannah, Kit will never become the Twenty Second Phantom. So, you know, again, you know, and and it's very, you know, I've watched a few of the Flash and Arrow and DC Legends of Tomorrow TV shows, and it's. And I'm not saying, you know, it's exactly the same or anything, but it is like that where if you make a decision, you do something, it does affect mm. the future. And so, you know, I understand why Tony's done it with Old Man Moz and it makes a great point. If Savannah gets free, Kit will never become the 21st Phantom. Now, is there a... Um, he has not outlined how that cause and effect yeah. will work. Now, is there a kind of like a, a way around it where it's like, okay, Kit will never become the 21st Phantom, but Kit and Heloise will become the 22nd Phantoms. So mm -hmm. I'm sure there's always ways around it. You know, maybe this is the way where Kit and Heloise become the joint Phantom yeah. Phantoms instead of Kit just being the sole 22nd Phantom. And that sort of comic trickery is why I thought the drummer might appear in the legacy of the drummer yeah. story. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, I'm enjoying these stories. Um, it'll be interesting how the uh, the Lungongo forest plays into it again. Uh, I will admit I wasn't a huge fan of the Lungongo forest because, you know, the you know a forest that no one's ever gone into before, just how big is the Phantoms area of Bengala, I Ivory Lana and Rodia. You know, are we talking about the whole of Africa or are we just, you know, there's only so much hidden areas in the Phantoms jungle. So that bit I'm kind of like a bit of a wait and see on. But um I like Savannah. I, I liked how she um uh became a good fawn in the Phantom side like you know, like in the in the stories, I'm going to win the Phantom, and I'm going to become a mother to these children, and and then when she realised that Diana was still alive, she goes, "Hey, I'm here to help you." And so, you know, I, I like Savannah as a as a character. Um, I think it's good, and I think Savannah has helped the Phantom with finding Diana, but also with the um, relocating the Croco men and a couple of other areas as well. The Phantom has to at least try and free Savannah. So mm. 
I mm. like that. Yep. And, and, and as I say, I'm um, more than happy to, because I, I thought she'd gone from us. Uh, I, I didn't think, in, in Lee Fork style, that would be the end of the Captain Savannah. We'd never see her again. Um, so I'm really pleased that uh, leave uh, that Tony DePaul is going back to that well. Yeah, and I think I think Tony he could have left her, and I don't think we would have been poorer off. But I think we may become richer if mm. we see her again. Yeah, agreed. All right, so watch this space. Uh, we we don't know. Perhaps by the time next uh, we have a comics and news, we'll be wrapping up. Um, that story, I suspect not. It's, I feel like it's got a, few, a bit more leg in it left. So um, let's see how we go going forward. Depends how long it is till our next comics and news too. We try to do them every yeah. month, but this has been a, a, a while between drinks. So uh, all things are all things are up in the air. Now, in terms of uh, wrapping off the rest of our comics and news, or let's say comics podcast, because this is stretching out, so it will be an A, 192A, this is the comics. Um, Regal Publishers now, unfortunately, uh, COVID has uh, been wrecking havoc uh, right through India at the moment. We certainly uh, send our uh, thoughts and prayers to all of our fans in India and all of the fan and fans and everyone in India with what they're going through at the moment. Um, so we hope all's well, but it does mean that Regal Publishers have not released a new uh, Phantom story in the interim. So um, watch this space and hopefully, um, you know, that'll be back on deck for the next one. Yeah. Now, just um, in the next in episode B, we do talk to Ankit and he does give us a little bit of a clue when the new comics from Regal might be published. So make sure you listen to B. Awesome. Um, Mythos Publisher, there, there have been a few comics that have come out, O Phantasma number 9, O Phantasma number 10, and Chronicles de, Faz- de Phantasma number 4. Um, unfortunately, I, well, I certainly don't have a copy of those. You don't have a copy of those yet, Germ, either? No? Um, and uh, we are still looking for someone from Brazil who would uh, like to uh, send us um, reviews of the comics so that hopefully we can be a bit more relevant to, to people there. Um, but congratulations to Mythos, who are back after uh, back publishing comics again. Um, we all know, or if you've been watching the news, you know that Brazil has been absolutely smashed as bad as anyone really uh, by COVID. Um, but Mythos are back um, publishing again after a bit of a hiatus. Um, the last they, they published in August 2020 and then had a breakthrough till April of 2021. So congratulations to, to Brazil, who have got a pretty healthy vaccination rate going on over there, and it's fantastic to see that uh, the publishers are coming back. Um, one country, though, that, hasn't, uh, that has not had a pause is, uh, uh, is Sweden and uh, Team Fantaman and the stories that they're producing. Um, Fantaman have produced four issues since last we spoke, 10 through to 15. So it looks like five, but it's actually four comics. But uh, um, issues since last time we did a comics and news. And so Mikel Lick is going to review those for us. So uh, thank you very much, Mikel, and, and take it away. Hello, and welcome back for another Phantom and Review by me, Mikel Lick. Today I'm not going to review one Phantom and comic, not. Two Phantom and Comic, not three Phantom and Comic, not four Phantom and Comic, yeah, yeah, four Phantom and Comics. I will do the review. First off, we have issue 1011 with a beautiful cover by Luke Arbata. I really love these light colors. It has the daily story, the Rodion Column which is the 252nd Phantom Daily Story and it was written by Tony DePaul and drawn by Mike Manley. Uh, it's about these armed strangers that are crossing the border from Rodia and walking with a few hours intervals with a common goal. I really enjoyed the action in these modern dailies and these are not an exception. Then we have a second daily story on page 66. And this is a really short story, Unfinished Business, also by Tony DePaul and Mike Manley. And it's, I mean, it's very short. It's almost like an extra story. Didn't have time to tell something big, but uh, quite okay. And then we have 
an old story, The Rogue Elephant, the 99th daily story, written by Lee Falk and drawn by Cyberry. Yumba is being elephant napped, and there is a rogue elephant on the loose in the jungle at the same time. What are the odds of that? It's black and white, which is not great in my book, but it's a Cyberry, and uh, it's good for those who came in late. Then we go to the next issue. Issue 12. Oh my god, this cover is amazing. Hendrik Solström really knocked it out of the park again. It's so cool. So this has the true story Requiem from 2019, written by Pid Anderson and art by Wendell uh, Cavalcanti. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, I'm sorry. But a uh, really great story about the 19th Phantom during the World War One. Or the Great War, as it was called back then. I'm usually against black and white, as you all know. But I feel this one actually really works with it. Uh, yeah, I can't complain. And then there is uh, another story. And uh, Team Phantom story with uh, the Lee Falk and Eskan Eralp. Once more, a black and white where he revisualized the folk story. But this one is quite good for its time. Uh, but this this uh, comic book also got some uh, publicity for being the first black and white comic for in a very long time. And uh, yeah, it also has this. Uh, article about it. It also has uh, this editorial space about the, the Australian book about the, the war uh, shields with Phantom on it. Then on to the next issue. Issue number 13. Another cover by Luca Arbata. I initially thought the facial expression fe felt a bit weird. But on social media someone pointed out that it might be a naughty 6th Phantom doing something in the background. Uh, this is for you YouTube listeners of course. Uh, but I mean it's it's a good cover. Uh, it has... It might be my favorite story of all time. The founding of the Jungle Patrol, the 64th Sunday story. It was originally published in 1964-65. Uh, written by Lee Falk and drawn by Cy Berry. It got everything. High lore value in the creation of the Jungle Patrol and the wife of the historic Phantom. A strong matinee feeling. The coloring is really, really good in this one as two. And uh, Andreas actually took really great effort in making sure that the Jungle Patrol costumes would have the same colors as in the original uh, Sunday coloring. Uh, here when they get their uniforms. Let's see here. Over here, yeah. And then there is another Lee Falk Öskan Eralp story. The Elephant Graveyard. And this is a story about the this professor and his daughter that are on a scientific expedition but run into a non-friendly tribe. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's an okay story. I really like the Olanga tribe backstory and it would be cool to read the original story of those events. It was an historic phantom that saved them and that would be also be a cool story. So, was there something else in this worth mentioning? Yeah, cool article about the darkest hours of the Jungle Patrol. And to the last issue for this time. Issue 1415 of 2021. It's another Luca cover it's not as strong as the other ones we've seen this time but i enjoyed the colors uh, it features the 
the daily story The Phantom Lion by Tony DePaul and Paul Ryan. It's too bad that it took so long before they published it in uh, in Sweden because I think it's quite a good story and it introduces the Queen of Longo character. Yeah, I like it. Uh, then there is The Curse by Dai Darrell and Öskan Eralp. It's a reprint from 1984 about this guy being cursed with many mystical things happening. So this story is not really my bag of tea because I'm not sure of how much I like this mystic things happening. Ah, but then we have a really great story. Diana in the Jungle Patrol by Magnus Knutsson and Jaime Valve. And this is another reprint from 1973, but this time it's a great story about what started as a bet between Diana and this uh, bat, uh, not want to, yeah, the, this not very PC friend who want, who is going to be the soldier the first, and it becomes a great adventure. And I mean, this story has such a great meaning for me, since it's one of the three stories I used. For the Phantom the card game. And speaking of the card game. Look at this great uh, piece in the editorial page. About the card game that uh, Andreas put there. I love it. And then on the back. This great one page advertisement for the game. Ah what a great what a great comic book. And that's all for me here in Sweden. Welcome back to you and... Glad midsommar. Happy phantoming. All right. Thanks, Mikel. Uh, really appreciate uh, your work. And as we said, if uh, anyone from Brazil would like to jump on board and review the Mythos stuff for us, we would love to hear from you. All right. Well, it's been a bit of a monster germ. We wanted to do comics and news. Uh, we knew from the outset that there was a lot of comics in particular. So we are going to call it a night here at 192A. Thank you very much for your time tonight, mate. Yeah, no, it's been great. Um, you know, even though there's been a lot of comics and stuff to review, it's been fun. Um, I've enjoyed doing the the Sunday and the dailies as well. So I think that's a, uh, a, another another um, you know another addition to an already uh, jam packed uh, podcast. But hopefully the fans out there uh, enjoy it. And for those who may not be able to get through comics or the Phantom Man comics and only get the um, read the daily and Sundays, maybe they'll. Uh, start to enjoy these podcasts just as much. Absolutely. And if you're not enjoying it because you disagree with what we're saying, if you're sitting there driving and listening to listening to us in the commute to work or on the bus or train or whatever, whatever it might be for you, and you're going, oh, my God, these guys just don't get it. I need to to uh, let them know my opinion. Please do let us know because we do love hearing um, other opinions and uh, what the fans are thinking. Um, so please jump on jump on any of your social medias and, and let us know. Um, certainly, we're on Facebook. You can look us up look us up there on chroniclechamber.com. We're also moderators of the Phantom Collector Group on Facebook. If you want to uh, go there and show off parts of your collection, perhaps we're on Twitter at chronicle underscore tweet. Um, or we're also on Instagram at Chronicle Chamber or YouTube. Um, hopefully, a lot of you have been enjoying watching us on YouTube and the the bits and pieces that German the editing suite has been able to throw on the screen for you as well search us there on chronicle chamber so you can see what uh not so much what we look like but perhaps what the pages look like that we're talking about yeah well, what we look like's not not, not a, um, an endorsement to want to watch us on on youtube <laughs> no it's not <laughs> No, it's not. Might be one that you can bring up with your girlfriend in the room so she can go, actually, this guy I'm hooked up with, he's not too bad after all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks very much for your time tonight. We're going to we're gonna follow this pretty quickly with a 192B, which is the news of the last couple of months. So uh, until next time, thanks very much for tuning in and happy family. Happy family, guys, and uh, thanks for listening. washed ashore the sole survivor of a shipwreck. And upon the skull of the man who killed his dad, he said, I'm mad, I must eradicate piracy, injustice and cruelty. And all my sons will follow me, so evildoers will believe that this man cannot die. The Phantom, the ghost who walks, the Phantom, enemies be 